This is episode 45 of the Magic Detective podcast. On this podcast, I talk about the enigmatic Quintino Marucci. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode 45. And before we get into today's episode, I do want to point you over to my blog at themagicdetective.com because I've been uh, posting articles that I'm sure you'll find rather interesting over there. There is no shortage of magic history articles uh, as we're quickly approaching 800 articles over there on the blog. So please check that out. Right now, the podcast has recently passed the 8,000 download mark. I have to laugh because it wasn't just about a year ago on Instagram, I was bragging about reaching 700 downloads, and now we've passed 8,000, which means we are very close to the 10,000 mark, which excites me very much. And all this with very, very minimal advertising, in fact, really no advertising at least no paid advertising. Um, I mentioned it on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and beyond that, not very many places. It has a lot of word of mouth, which I'm grateful to uh, my listeners for, because uh, they're obviously, uh, you are obviously sharing the uh, the podcast with others or telling people about it, because uh, getting more and more people to listen. So that is fantastic. I would ask one favor, though. If you do listen to the podcast and you haven't told anybody about it, please uh, let people know that you think might be interested in hearing it because, after all, it doesn't cost anything. It's free, and there's a lot of great content here. So I think um, anybody interested in magic or even theater history would be interested in the Magic Detective podcast. That's just my two cents. And now for today's feature... By the bumper intro I did, you may not have a clue as to uh, who's uh, who's the subject of today's podcast. Hmm. Though I know some of you will be very familiar with him. His real name was Quintino Marucci, and he was born September 1st, 1901 in Foggia, Italy. I hope I said that right. He is known to the magic world as Tony Slidini. His first name actually was not Tony, believe it or not. Apparently, many years ago, someone had mistakenly called him Tony. And because of his extreme politeness, as Dick Cavett put it, he never corrected the person and from there on out became known as Tony, at least his first name. He was, without question, one of the true masters of close-up magic to ever live and dominated much of the 20th century. His father was an amateur magician, but whether or not His father taught his son any magic that's not really known. At a young age, Tony moved to Buenos Aires, Argentina, to live with his uncle. And then when he became an adult, he immigrated to the United States while in his, I believe, in his late 20s. He came here to do magic, which means he was also doing magic in Argentina. He traveled across the country presenting his magic at venues as varied as museums and carnivals and even sideshows and private engagements. He was working as Mr. Marucci and he had a good 10-year run of performing magic without without the magic world ever knowing who he was. When he started performing in Patterson, New Jersey, the manager of the museum he was working at suggested the name Tony Foolham. The year was approximately 1936. Tony was 35 years old. According to an article in the February 1951 Linking Ring, fellow show people told Tony the name Tony Fulham was not very good and suggested because of his work, well, because it was very slick or very sly, as they put it, uh, that he should maybe use sly in his name and Another thing that was popular then, and it's even popular now, is to add Dini to your name, a la Houdini. Uh, So he became Slidini. That's where the whole Slidini thing came from. He settled in the Boston area for a time, and this is where the magic world first learned of him. Magician Herman Hansen introduced Slidini to the magic community in Boston. 
Eventually, Slidini's unusual approach and technique began to take the tiny world of magic by storm. New York City came calling again, and he moved back to the big city. All of this time, he was doing real-world shows. In other words, he was working for lay people. During World War II, he was a popular attraction at military bases and military camps and hospitals. We think of Slidini as a close-up master, which he no doubt was, but he also had a very stunning stage act as well. This aspect is often forgotten because so much emphasis is put on his close-up work. When he performed on stage, he wore a very Spanish-inspired outfit that resembled kind of a matador's costume. These, apparently, he handmade himself. When performing close-up magic, he wore a suit, although I have a feeling in the early days he may, may have worn that matador costume for close-up gigs, too, possibly. In the year 1948, the first Slidini trick appeared in a magic magazine. It was his paper balls to hat and it appeared in the January 1948 edition of the Sphinx magazine. His magic has been termed as natural magic because he didn't use fancy apparatus, but rather simple objects that people were familiar with. Coins, cards, balls, cigarettes, string, scarves, rope. And of course, there is one item uh, from the magician's bag that could be termed apparatus. That's the linking rings, though in all truth, his linking ring routine was different from everybody else's. It received the official Slidini stamp using both deceptive technique and huge doses of psychology. Tony Slidini did not get into magic like the rest of us with a magic set or magic books. He started at the age of 15. He invented his own techniques. Imagine that. He took a well-established art form and introduced moves and slights and techniques that no one had ever seen before. In 1949, he embarked on his first lecture tour across the country, teaching for the first time magicians how to do his incredible tricks. He would eventually own his own place in New York City to teach students. His list of students is remarkable. I'll give you a few, not all, just a few. Ricky Jay, Doug Henning, Dick Cabot, Cellini, Tony Clark, Rocco Solano, and many, many more. A question I've seen online regarding Slidini, uh, did he ever perform for lay people? And the, the answer is yes. I've already mentioned it, but yes, the answer is yes. He actually had many years of performing experience before lay people and before he ever got to do anything for magicians. And then for a long time, he continued working for lay audiences, even while teaching his techniques to his brother Magi. When I first began to search for biographical information on Slidini, I was shocked at how little there really was. But at the same time, his name is mentioned in thousands of magic magazine issues, as well as numerous books. No less than Theodore Bamberg, Okido, brags on Slidini in his book, Okido on Magic. Thankfully, Slidini is featured in his own books as well as in books of others like Stars of Magic. In March 1964, Scalzo, a student of Slidini, appeared on the cover of Genie magazine. In the body of the article on Scalzo, it mentions that he credits Slidini and his lessons for helping him to become a full-time entertainer. Genie had yet to do a feature on Slidini. It wasn't until September of 1967 before Slidini made the cover of Genie magazine, and it was long overdue. In the 1970s, talk show host and amateur magician Dick Cabot brought Slidini on his TV show. The first appearance by Slidini was one of the biggest shows ever. Mr. Cabot brought Tony back later that year. For many people, that footage of Slidini was their first exposure to the master. It was actually my second exposure, but I will say it completely slayed me. And I'm not sure this is true or not, but I'll bet of all the episodes of Dick Cabot's show over the years, that's probably the most watched in the history of his show. And for the record, Tony Slidini was 77 when those were recorded. I recently came across an online blog where there was a 
they were discussing those TV appearances, and in typical magician fashion, an argument ensued. Folks claiming that Tony was past his prime in those videos, or that Tony never really performed for lay people, or such and such a trick was lame. I hate to differ, but those clips are great. They were then, they are now. Granted, some of the material it may suffer a bit because our culture is used to doing things really, really fast, but there, there's a charm in the way that Slidini performed. And frankly, some extremely visual magic is done by Slidini. Take a look at his cigarette magic if you want spellbinding visuals or his one coin routine for pure entertainment, the paper balls with an audience volunteer. Now, this brings me to a story, and I'm sorry I can't give you the person's name who shared this story because it was on Facebook, and I didn't keep track of who put it down, but they were talking about Slidini in his later years. And he'd been hired to perform at a magic convention. He was introduced during the stage show, and he came out to do his famous paper ball trick. After Slidini's brief introduction to the audience, he made a, 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 a ball of paper uh, for the... Uh, seated spectator, and then he began to make that ball vanish. Well, this person, the spectator, the only one that it was supposed to fool, because if you know this routine, it's really meant for one person. The audience sees how everything's done. Well, let's just say the spectator busted him. And as the story, as it was related, it, it just was like a gut punch to the audience because here was here was the uh, the hero the icon of magic in this case probably past his prime and he was failing before a live audience many of who uh, were lay people who didn't have a clue who slidini was he was just some old guy on stage doing something with a paper ball as i read it it was oh just rips at your soul but then listen to this the next few words were very revealing. Slidini, the professional, continued on. How many of us would have stopped at that point knowing that we've been busted? Nope, not Slidini. He proceeded further into the trick and fooling the person again and again and again before returning to the standard technique, which is what everybody else does, but he had numerous techniques. It was a lesson to the entire audience of what a real professional Slidini was. A lesser performer, uh, younger performer, if you will, somebody just with not as much experience would have bailed. But Slidini had done that effect thousands of times in his life. He knew his material inside and out. He knew it better than anybody. You think that was the first time somebody caught him uh, doing his particular move in this case. He likely had outs that we never even thought of. But oh, when I read that story, it it just really resonated with me, the fact that here was this, this famous guy, and it seemed like he failed, but actually, nope, the joke's on you, audience. He didn't fail. He turned that thing around and just came out in flying colors. It's just, ah, oh, what a great story. Slidini was recognized with many awards throughout his career. In 1974, he won the Magician of the Year Award from the SAM Parent Assembly. Also in 1974, he received a Master's Fellowship from the Academy of Magical Arts. In 1982, Slidini was featured on the cover of Tannen's Magic Manuscript. In April of 1989, the SAM National Council established the Slidini Magic Fellowship Fund in honor of Tony Slidini and his outstanding achievements in close-up magic. One of the purposes of the fund was to provide scholarships and awards to magicians interested in the art of close-up magic. Tony Slidini died on January 15, 1991 from heart failure. He'd been ill for a while and had spent the last couple years of his life in a nursing home. He's buried in Orange, New Jersey. And, by the way, if you happen to know where his grave is, please contact me because I would like to know. 
Genie Magazine printed a short obituary promising a tribute uh, in the, the following issue of their magazine. However, as far as I could tell, none was ever printed. I, I went month and month and month after, and, and there was nothing. The next time Slidini was featured on the cover of Genie Magazine was in March 2016, where they had done an article on the forgotten Stars of Magic on the cover. This, by the way, this is not a knock on Genie Magazine. How Magic Magazines are able to do what they do is amazing in itself, because unlike major magazines, there's a tiny staff, sometimes one or two people. I love Genie Magazine, so I'm not knocking it in any way. Oh, by the way, if you're wondering about Magic Magazine, Stan Allen's magazine, well, they didn't even begin publishing until several months after Slidini had already passed away. Just the other night, I watched a strange video on YouTube, and I'm not going to give you the link, but I just want to tell you about it. It was a young millennial-aged magician who was going to watch Slidini for the first time. Now, the video was of him watching Slidini. Uh, Slidini doing the paper balls trick. And uh, I reluctantly watched the video. And I have to say, to my great joy, I saw this guy's face light up as he watched the master. Here was a kid who knew the paper ball trick. Apparently, he, he claimed he even did it. And then Slidini was just destroying him throughout the routine. At the end, this young fellow was blown away by the various subtleties and techniques that he saw Slidini do. He even said, I need to go back and learn his way of doing it. And good for you, young man. I was really glad to hear that. My recollections of Slidini, the first time I saw Slidini was on a TV show called Wonderama, hosted by Bob McAllister, who was also a magician, by the way. And I, uh, this is a vague memory, but I, I recall Slidini doing some sort of coin tricks. I, I, I think, uh, I thought it was a coins across, but I think it was probably coins through the table that I saw him do. And after I saw it, I ran to my library. And at the time, my magic library consisted of two books, one of which was the Amateur Magician's Handbook by Henry Hay. And just so happens, there happened to be a version of Coins Across in that book. So, um, but I, it, it was not Slidini's version or Slidini's method by any chance, uh, because he invented his own. The next time I saw Slidini was uh, on the Dick Cavett show. And of course, on there, he does numerous coin tricks. He does his untying scarf routine, the helicopter card, the paper balls. There are two, two, two different paper ball tricks. Uh, one of them is a paper ball into a, uh, like a box. And then the, the other one is the paper balls with the spectator. By the way, it wasn't long after that that, uh, of course, I was just a kid back then. So Santa Claus delivered a set of Slidini books to me for Christmas. Thankfully, my dad had watched the uh, Dick Cavett episode with me, so he was able to work all that out. Uh, I got very lucky there. I learned so much of the Slidini material, and I always enjoyed presenting it whenever I could. But uh, I learned the close-up Slidini stuff, and I didn't have a lot of close-up gigs. So instead, whenever I would do Slidini material, it was usually for family or friends. I remember one, this one other thing I want to mention. I remember when I showed my buddy Bobby Diamond the Slidini videos. He had just started getting interested in magic, and I said, well, you got to see this guy. He about lost his mind. I mean, seriously, he just flipped over Slidini like nothing I'd ever seen. The next day, he called Al's Magic Shop in Washington, D.C., ordered every book on Slidini that they had put out which I think at the time was four or five books. I know that uh, Slidini was prominently featured in Stars of Magic. I know Bobby had that. And he ended up learning all the Slidini material. He loved to do things, this is my friend Bobby, he loved to do things that were harder than the average or a bit unorthodox. And Slidini's material wasn't necessarily hard as much, it was, as, as, much as it was different. It just had a different approach to it. And so much of it was psychology and, and that, that, that went into the presentations. Of course, like many people who learned Slidini material, you couldn't help but on occasion talk like Slidini. I think that was only natural. 
Uh, I don't recall a student that I've seen perform who doesn't have some little tinge of uh, either Slidini's voice or his mannerisms. Uh, mannerisms, that's not the word. It's just a, kind of an inflection in their voice that, that they sound like uh, Slidini. I, I remember Bobby and I used to, we would joke, we would just say, all tobacco out, all tobacco out. And we instantly knew that we were both thinking of the uh, Slidini material. Here's something magician Arthur Leroy said about Slidini. I believe I was honest when I shrugged off Slidini as a magician's magician. Then, I had the pleasure of appearing on a bill with him before an audience of lay people who cared nothing for technicalities. They had come to be entertained. Slidini took the stage and enchanted, mystified, and put the audience in his pocket. This was no magician's magician. This was and is a magician in great big capital letters, an artist of rare ability. And by the way, another quote from Dick Cavett. He said, Di Vernon once told me that he lives for those rare moments when he is still fooled. And they're sometimes years apart. And Dick Cavett asked him, well, who can still fool you? Vernon said, nobody, regretfully. But then he added, ah, of course, Tony can. For now, my friends, I hope you've enjoyed this episode on the life and the magic of Tony Slidini. If you are interested in the various books on Slidini that are on the market, I'm going to give you a list of some of them. There is The Best of Slidini and More by Carl Fulves, The Magic of Slidini by Louis Ganson, The Annotated Magic of Slidini by Louis Ganson and Tony Slidini, The Magical World of Slidini by Carl Fulves, The Best of Slidini, Slidini Encores, and of course, Stars of Magic. These are strictly, I would say, for the serious student of magic. If you're just merely curious how he did his tricks, don't waste your time or money. Also, a lot of these books are out of print. Uh, in fact, I think most of them are out of print, except for maybe the annotated Magic of Slidini. But they're still available. You can hunt them down, go on eBay or whatever, or look in the magic auctions and you'll, you'll be able to find them. One other thing I'll leave you with to ponder. I wonder, I wonder if we as a magic community did a disservice to Slidini by hogging him to ourselves. I think maybe no, but, but I also believe that he should have been a superstar. Not, not like the Beatles or the Rolling Stones, but rather like, like Senor Wences or Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, he should have been a household name. And granted, uh, I know my younger listeners are like, Senor Wences, Edgar Bergen, who's that? Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, they were famous entertainers of their day, and everybody knew who they were, and more importantly, everyone adored them. And I'll be honest, I feel this way about a lot of magicians. We're lucky if there's a handful of, of magicians that become national names. And even of those handful, not all of them become national names. If I had to make a list of acts and performers I thought should be nationally famous, I'd never have time to talk about magic history because I, all I'd be doing is reciting names. I have such a deep respect and love for the art and for its practitioners. I think we deserve better. Now, having said that, I'm going to put the links to the uh, Dick Cavett Slidini videos in the uh, written intro to the podcast. So please check those out. If you haven't, uh, have, have you, if, you've, if you've never seen them before, you've got to see them. If you've seen them before, go back and watch them. They're really, really great. He was truly one of a kind and extremely amazing. And that, my friends, will do it for this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to like the podcast. And if you listen on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, consider giving me a five-star review as that will help me greatly in getting more people to see and hear about the podcast. 
Until next time, I'm Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective. Be well and be safe.